right there, perfect. Excellent. I am going to have the session. Um, best of luck to you all. Have a good conversation. Liz, would you like to go ahead and get started? You're on mute. <laughs> Hi. Okay, I'm gonna get started. Hi, my name is Liz Padolinski and uh, Nicole Cropper and I are here for this breakout section session um, of safety and enforcement. Uh, next slide. Hi, this is uh, Sean with IT. Um, I didn't receive any uh, other documents other than the one that's being shown. That's all there is? Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just uh, begin. Um, let me do a few things. It looks like we have quite a few people here. The first thing we're going to do is have a virtual poll. And I guess, Sean, you handle that? Yes, uh, I'll open it. You want me to open it up right now? Sure. Okay, I'll do that right now. Yeah. So this poll, um, please complete it. And so we, so uh, Nicole and I know who is here. I'm not seeing it. Is it there? Yes, the poll's up. Oh, okay. Um, okay, while that poll, while you're filling out, while you're um, filling out the poll, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Liz Podolinsky. I am a policy analyst in the safety and enforcement division of the CPUC. And um, my uh, position there is to be a policy advisor to the director of the division, um, Lee Palmer. Nicole, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Nicole Cropper. I am Commissioner Rush Offense Assistant. Um, I do a lot of different things. And I'm also helping out the Office of the Commission um, with our voting meetings and whatnot. Um, and a lot of my role is to help implement the Environmental and Social Justice Action Plan. Okay, thank you. Um, so the goal of this session is to brainstorm some potential new action items for the uh, environmental and social justice action plan update. Um, the action plan has nine goals, like incorporating equity into decision making, increasing access to programs and services, promoting workforce development opportunities, and ways to participate in the CPUC processes. Specifically for this session, the goal that um, uh, the commission has on safety is enhancing enforcement to ensure safety and consumer protection for ESJ communities. And um, the goal again is to brainstorm ideas of how, um, how there could be some new action items with safety as the goal, increasing safety. Um, we hope to make this uh, as interactive as possible this session. There are a few ways you can participate. Um, you can give a verbal comment or ask a question. You will click the hand next to your name in the participant list, list and I will call on you and unmute you when it is your turn and you can speak. Um, I mean, I have to get to everyone, but I will do my best. Um, you can also leave um, comments in the chat. 
Um, and then there is an email um, that you can also send your and anything you'd like in the email, which is esjactionplan at cpuc.gov. Um, and um, we will try to weave as much as we can from the chat box into the discussion. Nicole will be the one to monitor the chat, the chat box. Um, and we will be, see, be saving um, the chat so we can um, record your feedback. And just before we start a reminder that this session is being recorded so that we can save all the feedback and comments. So, uh, Sean, what do we do about the virtual poll? Does it just stay up or is it over? Can we end it now? Yeah, I could uh, go yeah, ahead and end it. it. Okay, cool. So we'll be closing in 17 seconds. Okay, and then we get, I, I can see some results. We can yes. see some results. Yes. Did the results pop up? Not that I can see them. I have the results here. Liz, if you go to the polling section of your WebEx, you should be able to see them, but I'll go ahead and okay, um, good. let you know who we have. So it looks like we have about nine PUC staff members. We have one policy or advocacy organization, a couple of utility representatives, about three state agency representatives, two people from the local government and five people who indicated other who are attending this session today. Okay. Great. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, first of all, describe many of you probably know uh, about the safety and enforcement division of the PUC, but I'm going to do a little introduction of what SED does. And so we can kind of think about how we could, um, uh, integrate ESJ considerations into SED's work. So, um, SED, Safety and Enforcement Division, oversees the safety of electric and communication facilities, poles, wires, natural gas infrastructure, like pipelines, and propane facilities. And I also want to say that I'm looking at another screen with my script, so I'm kind of looking back and forth. Um, SED has three branches um, comprised of utility engineers, analysts like me, investigators that focus on ensuring the safety of utility infrastructure and reducing utility caused wildfires. Um, the way FCD does it does its work is it performs safety audits of electric and gas infrastructure. It conducts investigations on incidents and it appears in safety proceedings. Uh, the three branches are the electric safety and reliability branch. So they're looking at the electric infrastructure, uh, the gas safety and reliability branch that deals with gas system. And then the newest branch is the wildfire safety and enforcement branch. And it enforces public utility wildfire safety and public safety power shutoff violations. Um, WSCB, the Welfare Safety and Enforcement Branch, is the lead investigator for utility incidents relating to wildfire, PSPS events, and other aspects related to wildfire events. Uh, the way um, SED works is it does audits, investigations. If SED or an engineer, whoever is doing an audit or investigation, finds a violation, uh, SED has the authority to is issue citations with penalties against utility operators who violate public safety, safe, public safety, public utility safety codes and other requirements. And the authority SED has is from general orders, public the public utilities code, or a CPUC resolution. Uh, for example. Um, recently, the CPUC, the, the gas branch, cited a mobile home park operator for um, violating general order 112F, which requires a mobile home gas operator to conduct, 
conduct a gas leakage survey every five years. The last survey this mobile home park operator conducted was 13 years ago. That's a violation. It has a penalty. Um, the electric branch cited and penalized an electric utility for failing to properly mark underground facilities. And this resulted in an injury. And the SED's authority for that citation and that penalty is General Order 128, which applies to all underground electric supply and communication systems that the CPUC regulates. So here's some kind of generally looking at SED and how um, ESJ fits in is general orders do not include ESJ considerations currently. Um, therefore, SED audits, SED investigations don't include uh, ESJ considerations. However, the CPUC can modify uh, general orders it can modify resolutions to include those considerations. So today's brainstorm is like, what would those considerations be that would go into these different general orders? Another issue is that SED doesn't have any environmental engineers currently. So this would be um, something that would require training. So the engineers that do go and audit would be able to conduct an environmental audit. In addition, just uh, there are some safety considerations that other state agencies may be better. Uh, that state agency is better suited to consider a concern, such as emissions from a power plant that affect air quality in a neighborhood. Um, the Air Resources Board may be the state agency that would handle that, not the CPUC. So this is. Um, a brainstorming session. Um, what kind of e, e, uh, e, ESJ concerns presently involve safety? What would an ESJ audit look like? What would the engineer be looking for? Um, how could we direct an auditor inspector to do such an audit? Um, so at this point, I can open it up. That was a, a pretty short introduction. If you have a, any other questions, let me know. Um, and I think that's that's it. So I'm looking at. And well, I know if a hand goes up. I'm looking at the participant list right now, and so I'm checking to see who has their hand up at this moment. Um, and again, the question is really how do we, um, what ESJ concerns presently involve safety? Right. Right. So I, I can, um, are there any hands? Because I can kind of. Um, Not at this moment. No, I'll let you know when there are. But if you have any comments on that, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. So I, um, yesterday I listened to the wildfire safety breakout session and there, there was a lot of, um, I, I looked at the chat and I listened in um, about um, how these PSPSs are being managed by the utilities and um, disabled people, um, people that need electricity to live, how um, how should those, how would um, those considerations be handled by the safety and enforcement division? Since we do have uh, one of our branches, the welfare safety and enforcement branch that does deal with the public safety power shutoffs through our issuing of guidelines. Um, the last set of guidelines or the, the new set of guidelines was last um, approved by the commission in June. And one of the issues I heard was notification of people so they have enough time to make plans. And that is one of the guidelines that is out is is in the in the PSPS guidelines is there are certain certain people are alerted in order based on like medical baseline. Um, individuals. Um, they are one of the, the first to be alerted that there could be a public safety power shutoff. Um, are those adequate? Are those what, how there have been a lot of, there have been some issues um, with how the utilities have performed their PS or executed their PSPS events. Um, how could the SED 
improve the safety of um, Californians in PSPSs. Liz, it looks like we do. Will Abrams. Okay. Sean, do I ask if you can. Nope. Sean, if you could unmute Will Abrams, that would be great. Thank you. Go ahead, Will Abrams. Oh, um, I sent out a. You have to I sent out a, sorry, I sent out a request to unmute them. Um, William, you could, um, there you go. All right. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide some feedback. Um, I, I think, you know, through the social justice um, lens, I think it's going to be very important for the safety enforcement division to define their uh, SLAs or service level agreements associated with their activities. I think part of what will help us understand it, the degree to which there's equity in terms of your role uh, will be to understand um, what, uh, what your responses are within various communities. And so, um, you know, what I mean by that is if there is a you know, safety issue detected uh, by your division or a member of the public, you know, what is the expectation in terms of turnaround time to be able to address that? Uh, what is the pathway for those things to get resolved? And then as you measure that, you'll be able to understand the degree to which you have uh, made progress within um, communities that are disproportionately uh, disadvantaged. Um, and, um, but without sort of that baseline and establishing your, uh, the service level expectations for your work, it will be very hard for us to sort of look through this lens to understand, um, you know, how we're advancing environmental and so social justice without understanding sort of baseline uh, measurements for how you all um, uh, gauge success. So, can you give an example of something you're talking about? Like some, some there, there's obviously a safety issue with some sort of piece of infrastructure, and how so, quickly it would be it would be addressed or handled or repaired or made safe. Is that is that what you're talking about? So, so let me I, give you an example of that. So, if um, you know a member in 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 the community uh, saw a uh, a safety issue and uh, had a concern about how that would affect uh, their community. Um, and they made a call into um, the PUC or they uh, provided a public comment at one of, uh, one of the meetings. Um, how, what's the expectation from the safety enforcement division in terms of that response? Uh, is your expectation that you would be responding to that within 24 to 48 hours? Um, how is that response time in uh, San Francisco different from your response time in Sonoma County? Um, understanding um, how that relates to the response time of the utilities. Um, I think part of that also has to do with other attributes in terms of how you respond and, um, you know, the reporting that goes into that and the resolution process. Um, I think without that type of information about sort of very specifically about what your expectations are for service, um, you know, it'll be difficult to measure how well you're doing in one community or another. It, are those differences just related to staffing? Are those issues related to uh, other issues that might fall under the lens of, of environmental and social justice issues. Um, you know, I think, you know, another way to sort of look at that is, you know, look at the proceedings uh, for which uh, SED is most engaged and try to understand how uh, public participation is, uh, is measured, right? So um, is there a public participation hearing? How is that structured? How is the input within that public participation measured and seen and processed through the proceeding 
and uh, ending up with the commission in terms of their decisions. I think these are the types of sort of access issues and equity issues that really um, need to be at that objective uh, measured in that objective measured way. Um, because otherwise, I think, you know, part of what we end up doing is is talking uh, very broadly about social justice and environmental justice um, in very aspirational terms um, and indicate that we, you know, have an intention, uh, which I wholeheartedly know that the, the commission has uh, to mm -hmm. sort of move that forward, but without really having an understanding about how we measure that. And so similar to how we measure other things within the PUC in terms of utility progress, um, I think it would be great to be able to use those same types of tools to measure how uh, the CPUC is moving forward. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do you have an example of, I mean, not an example, like an idea about the um, increasing public participation or like, yeah, increasing it, getting it in different communities in these proceedings? Yeah, so I think the first step for that is that, you know, in my mind, um, there should be no um, proceeding where there is not a public participation hearing of some type. Mm -hmm. And I think really taking a look at what is a public participation hearing, how can that be approached in different ways? Um, because I know that, you know, there are a lot of time pressures under certain proceedings, but how do we just not sort of bypass the opportunity to engage with the public? Um, so, you know, as an example, there are wildfire mitigation plans that are very important to um, to the public in terms of how they're going to be able to afford insurance, how they're going to feel safe in their homes. And so to think that we would move forward through those types of proceedings and not really engage the public to really understand in a very measurable way what their input is and look at that as really a counterbalance to what we're doing in terms of gauging what the utilities um, are doing I think um, we'll largely miss the mark in terms of environmental and social justice and just going out and sort of having, uh, you know, two minutes at the podium to speak your mind um, or, you know, writing a, a, a comment um, on the proceeding page and having no knowledge of sort of the process or how that's going to be evaluated, um, I think is, right. is a hindrance, right? So if I'm going to um, take the time to sort of craft a a letter to have included in the proceeding, I'd like to understand how that's going to be evaluated, how I can really um, be constructive, right, in terms of that feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that um, SED can really communicate about your criteria for evaluating that public comment, you will be uh, able to garner more public comment because people will feel confident that that comment doesn't just sit, you know, sit on a shelf but it's evaluated with a very specific process. Um, and I think that that will go a long way, both in terms of, of uh, transparency and public awareness, but also in terms of just overall safety, because you know um, the commission and SED only has a certain number of folks, right? Who can do the monitoring and who can yes. do, um, do that actively. So the amount of which you will be able to engage the, the public as partners at looking at safety issues and informing the commission or utility about those safety issues will really have to do with how well the process is defined and where people see an opportunity to engage in the process. So I would say that there really needs to be a very specific um, methodology and process defined where this is how SED does business in this way, in this circumstance, in this community. One, two, three, four, here are the areas where we're gonna be able to have public engagement. Here's how that public engagement will be evaluated. And here's how it rolls into our overall decisions. I think thinking through the arc of that methodology will really help um, to uh, advance, you know, social and environmental justice through that lens, through actively engaging with the public. Hmm. Hope that helps. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I know, um... In public participation hearings that they're required in, you know, rate cases and mergers. Um, and, okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
At this time, we don't have any other hands raised, but well, I would like to follow up on your comment. Um, you said, you know, having kind of a baseline framework was important for us to, you know, be able to understand what we need to even be, you know, enforcing or with safety measures. Do you have, and this is open to all the participants actually, do you have specific, like what should we be looking at? Like what are the safety measures that we should be looking at that we're not currently considering? Or what are the current environmental and social justice indicators that we're not currently considering? Sure. You know, I think there's a, a large overlap with uh, sort of the, the progress that that uh, the commission is making around things like the wildfire mitigation plans and social and environmental justice, right? Because part of that um, overlap has to do with, um, you know, if, if folks aren't safe in their homes, you know, they're not getting uh, the type of environmental justice that they need, right? And so if we're not working towards climate change adaptation, we're not getting towards the social justice that we need. And if we're not doing those things in an equitable way, we're not achieving that. So I think part of what this is, is really um, identifying and measuring risk, right? So part of what, what I've been sort of advocating for through that lens is a real uh, scientific measurement approach to how much does a tree limb and a line um, uh, increase risk, right? And so measuring risk so having risk reduction ratios at every point of the process, understanding the infrastructure and what contributes to risk. How does that risk different? Different is how is that risk different within um, uh, particular communities, right? And so how is that different within an urban environment versus a, a suburban environment versus a rural environment? And and looking at those things um, in that way. Uh, both serves sort of the general uh, thrust of, of uh, safety enforcement, but also um, manages to get at a more granular level to understand um, uh, uh, environmental and social justice issues. Um, and so really, I think the key is um, setting those expectations, measuring all of those things so that you have the tools to understand um, the scope of the issues. Um, you know, I think um, in terms of which, I, you know, I keep sort of hammering home, I think it's really important, uh, particularly with how you engage the public, that it's measured, right? And so um, part of this that we just know, and it's to, to no one's fault, right, is that we have a huge amount of resources on the utility space, on the utility side, uh, financial resources, legal resources, advocating for positions, right? And so if we're going to try to have um, uh, decisions that also include um, a, a good amount of public participation, we really need to understand, um, okay, somebody walks to the podium in a meeting and they provide two minutes of public comment. How does that two minutes relate to uh, the particular proceeding? How is that measured? Right. Um, what makes uh, a two minute public comment turn into an action for the commission? How does that weigh? Um, and, and so each and every communication vehicle, right, would have sort of a different um, metric for how uh, and a different methodology for how that is weighed and how it makes its way into a proceeding. Um, but, you know, part of what's clear, right, is that individuals, there's a, a lot of uh, needed in, in most cases bureaucracy for engaging as a party in a proceeding, right? Um, but it might be easier to go in front of a podium for two minutes and trying to understand across those various ways that the public engages, how all of those things make its way to the commission's desk is um, is important. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm great. Myself. Thank you. No, that's okay. I would like to mention that we do have Commissioner Reshtoff on the line. So we'll open the floor to the CP. Thank you, Nicole. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Will, for, for those comments and uh, the others you made earlier this morning. I wanted to uh, throw out another question for the group or get some feedback. 
And I, some of some folks may be aware, others may not, that the the PUC has recently adopted an enforcement policy to guide the exercise of our enforcement discretion and to set forth policies for all of the divisions that uh, are under the, the PUC in taking enforcement actions. And this goes for investigations, penalty settling cases, and so forth. One issue that we haven't finalized and that we're we're starting to work on is the guidelines for when we approve supplemental environmental projects or mitigation projects in lieu of penalties. Other agencies have formal policies for when they think that's appropriate and how much of a penalty should be mitigated, how much has to mitigate the affected community, what the nexus has to be between the actual violation and the remedial measures that are taken, issues like that. These types of projects are often championed by environmental justice communities because they feel like it's the money can be spent more effectively in the communities that have borne the impacts of a violation and then the money goes typically, if there's a fine, it goes to the general fund, the, the state's treasury. So I'm wondering if any if anyone has had experience with these projects in other contexts and other agencies, or if anyone wants to could give some feedback on this general notion uh, that we're 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 going to be working on. Thank you, Commissioner. And I would remind folks if you would like to make a comment or respond, please raise your hand, and we can get you unmuted in the chat box. So, Commissioner Rechtschaffen, I have um, a question. Um, is, you mean kind of like a mitigation like CEQA has? Like they can mitigate, like they can do certain things and the penalty goes down? It could be, it, it could be, it's not in the CEQA context, Liz, so much. It's more that if you agree to, for example, in, pay for this environmentally beneficial project that will reduce exposure to certain pollutants in the community, part of the part or all the penalty may be waived. Okay. So this has to be it obviously has to be in in addition to what a utility or other regulated entity would otherwise be required to do to comply with the law. But in the context of safety, it could be if there's uh if there's a violation related to um, failure to f follow certain wildfire, wildfire safety mitigation rules that you do a project in the community that's affected uh, in lieu of paying a penalty that goes beyond okay. your normal compliance obligations. Okay, got it. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a, a if you're a, a transportation network, a ride sharing company, and you you are operating, some of your drivers don't have the proper licenses, you would do extra education about you know, safe driving or, or do extra measures to promote safety beyond what, what you're required. All right. I do have a couple of responses in the chat. Um, if I can go ahead and read those. Matthew George says penalties are either to drive behavior or reallocate resources. And he also says, so if remedial acts or some sort of specific performance can benefit the agreed community, both goals will be accomplished. And again, that's from Matthew George. And then we also have a comment from Yvonne Chi, who says examples of SEPs that benefit disadvantaged communities include installing air filtration devices, schools, community centers and res residences, excuse me, to reduce the community's exposure to air pollution, monitoring groundwater quality from infiltrating stormwater to detect harmful contaminants, uh, providing regular health screenings for affected communities or providing community members training to enable them to identify environmental violations and to notify regulatory agencies of those violations. Exactly. That's Yvonne's comment is a is a much more specific and helpful illustration of what some 
of these projects could consist of. Got it. We'll be evaluating this over time, so we certainly uh, we certainly welcome people's perspective and in the in the normal course of of our regulatory work we will be we do bring enforcement cases and those are subject to decisions of public review and the public can certainly comment on aspects of specific decisions in that way but I think it'd be helpful to uh, if people have thoughts about the broader policy to hear from them over time. And there's a, yeah, there's some more information in the chat about the Air Resources Board supplemental environmental policy. So at this time, Anybody we don't have any other, to... yeah, there were no other comments or hands raised regarding the commissioner's question. So Liz, if you'd like to move on to the next question. Um, well, one of the questions, what, um, so, and Will Abrams, you said like, what, um, as far as safety concerns, um, one thing I was thinking about, uh, is as far as collecting data on, um, monitoring the electric infrastructure and sometimes electric infrastructure, I'll, I'll say, well, not electric, but communications infrastructure, um, may, uh, you know, have some problems and um, would it be worthwhile to find out if um, that infrastructure is um, cleaned up, let's say, um, quicker in some areas than other areas, depending upon what the, who that community is? You know, do some communities get quicker service than other communities? And um, that may be something that the SED could, you know, possibly uh, so some data gathering and, and promote or collect and see if there is some sort of correlation. Um, so that was something I was thinking about that as something to, you know, out, kind of outside the box. Um, because that is a safety concern. I know that there there have been a lot of incidents involving poles. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is uh, one of the things that uh, SED does is conduct audits of generation plants. Um, and it the engineer goes through a checklist and is looking for certain things. That list could be expanded, you know based on, uh, you know, it would have to go through a commission procedure, but it could be expanded to in, include uh, environmental and or social justice concerns about how you evaluate a power plant. Does anybody have anything, any other ideas, any comments? At this time, there are no hands raised, and there's no comments in the chat about that. So this is a brainstorming session. So um, <laughs> if you don't, there's no like answer going to happen here. It's kind of like SED would, uh, you know, wants to involve you know the public in in uh, in, in going in um, in moving this forward. Well, there's an interesting comment in the chat. Maybe Nicole, you can about using Cal and Virus Screen. Sure. So, this is from Yvonne Chi, and she says, "Do you look at Cal and Virus Screen census tracts and environmental indicators to determine which communities are considered vulnerable and disadvantaged?" SED can designate the census tracts that score at the highest 25 percent for environmental burdens, 
as the communities in need of tailored enforcement actions. Maybe those communities can receive more safety audits. Perhaps the penalties for violations in these communities could be higher. Perhaps those communities can get quicker service. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so we do, um, I, I'm familiar with the Callan viral screen. So um, what would have to be done is what is, what are we looking for? Or what's happening that in that community or what's happening in California and how do we, um, look at the calendar, use the Cal and virus, virus screen to see if that problem is being solved um, differently in different communities. And so what would be interesting is to kind of have some examples of what those safety issues are. I mean, there are a lot of safety issues. So would it be holes that are falling down? Would it be, um, you know, are the wildfire behaviors different by the, you know, what, you know, so what we have to do is what's our objective? What are we looking at? What are the safety issues that would be good to use the Cal virus screen for? I am not seeing any hands raised mm -hmm. at the moment. Okay. Hello, I'm Sing So from Apsara Association. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, uh, I want to, I'm working as social services. I, I have uh, an idea regarding the concern, a uh, safety concern, because uh, you see in my, in my, uh, village, uh, we don't have, we need to, uh, we, we have uh, raised concern to the, to the mayor already uh, for, to create a sidewalk for the, for, and the safety, uh, uh, we need uh, the life for, for when the evening, when the people ca come back from work, no, no sidewalk for the, for the handicapped person. For the disabled person, there is a big concern regarding safety. So we we suggest to create a sidewalk to put the uh, uh, stop light at the corner of the Alpine and Alvaro Avenue, and uh, put light to, to along the, the road so that to to have more secure. That's all. Mm -hmm. Um, some of those safety issues are not um, something that the CPUC could or SED could um, deal with. Um, I guess one is lighting for, I, I assume on um, a road would be done by either the city you live in, depending upon who, or it could be done by a utility. And in that case, the, SE, um, the CPC does have some jurisdiction. But I don't know what city you're talking about. If, if the lighting is, who, who, who provides lighting? Uh, I, I don't know exactly because I just uh, raised my concern. I don't know how to, uh, to, to con to deal with um, the the city or the mayor or the governor, I don't know. Sorry. So there is a response to your um, to your question, sir, and it says keep on your mayor, and then it also says city. The city and county will usually take care of your this local street lighting issues. And I this is okay. John. And this, this is Sean Simon, I'm the advisor to Commissioner Rexhoff, and <clears throat> I think the comment actually does raise an important point, which is the the impacts that were discussed in the workshop are really far reaching and are um, and, and varied, and I don't it's good to know them and identify them and deny them 
define them, but I don't think they need to be ultimately be defined. So really the Vaughn's point about the data collection is a really important piece with regards to communities and other socioeconomic factors. Um, to have that be part of our process, separate from focusing on jurisdiction or what the right outcome is, really just developing our systems that incorporate the data. And there's a lot of crossover in this discussion with the with the earlier session on data, where I mm -hmm. think um, could be brought into our safety work. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Sean. Um, what I, my concern is, we just don't want to collect data. We want to have some sort of focus on what kind of data we want and what, what's our objective, what's our goal. Um, that, that's, that's kind of, so it's, it's, it's more focused than just collecting data. I mean, the Kellen virus screen has a ton of data. It's like amazing. Um, but what's our objective in using it and how, how can we best use it by having a goal? of what we're looking for or looking at. Hi, Liz, this is Yvonne, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, sorry, I wasn't sure whether I needed permission to unmute, um, but um, I think one way of honing in on you know, the data that needs to be collected is potentially to, you know, whenever, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with how it works, but um, whenever there is a, a um, a violation to sort of document where that violation is happening, you know, the socioeconomic makeup mm -hmm. and the racial makeup of the community in which it is happening. Um, and then just to collect that kind of data over time, whenever there is, you know, some CPUC action that is taken um, for, uh, for, for the public. And then mm -hmm. maybe that data collected over time can help hone in on, you know, the issues that are frequently cropping up for some of the most vulnerable communities, and then to later target those issues in audits and in enforcement. Thanks, that's, yeah, that would be a great data collection <laughs> um, project, yes. So one of the um, one of the uh, things that SED is focusing on is mobile home parks and um, um, prioritizing um, those mobile home parks that uh, are um, more disadvantaged than other and other mobile home parks as far as uh, making sure the infrastructure works um, and uh, that it's it's safe, and so um, as far as what Yvonne you were saying is where these violations happen, um, you could even say in mobile home parks, you know what kind of violations are they and where are they they happening the most? And I, I think we may have that data um, because we do do audits every five years, um, and then put the layer of the Enviro screen on that. There is a question in the chat, Elizabeth, um, from Matthew George, who asked, are we working with HCD to identify parks with violations in other areas? So are we currently coordinating with HCD for that information? To identify what in other areas? I didn't hear. Um, parks I can't see the chat. Have, it's okay. Parks who have violated, um, who have violations in other areas. Oh, mobile home parks. <laughs> yes, mobile home parks. And HCD being, I can I can take that one. Thank you. <laughs> Housing and com community development. So, oh, thank you. Yes. So yes, where the piece the PC does work really closely with HCD on a on a in a couple ways. Part of what I think Elizabeth was talking about was program that we have it's called a mobile home park utility conversion program and so in the 
up until 1980, mobile home parks were done by master metered. So the, the gas and electric infrastructure was all managed by the mobile home park owner. And the both the materials and then the upkeep of the systems is not always on par with what an investor on utility has the resources to do. And so this program covers the cost to, to replace all of that infrastructure with utility infrastructure. And that program prioritizes uh, based on safety risk. And HCD, um, so it's, it's a bit of a shared jurisdiction there. So we have a longstanding relationship of working closely with HCD. Um, that's not to say there aren't other areas um, where we can collaborate and we are working um, through agreements to work more closely with them. That's a really important point. Thank you, Sean. Elizabeth, I'm just going to know we have about four minutes left. So okay. if it's okay, I'll go ahead and summarize the takeaways from this session. Thank you. So folks can get back to the main session. Um, so basically, just to um, bring it back to the issue of safety and enforcement in environmental and social justice communities, um, we heard from Will Abrams, who said that establishing baseline service level expectations is really important to be able to even know what we are like what information we need to gather. Um, we also heard that um, Calum virus, excuse me, Calum virus screen can be a great data collection tool. And it should be a part of our safety enforcement work. For instance, when there's a violation, we can document where the violation is occurring. And over time, we can compare it to what is happening in the region, the socioeconomic um, situation of these locations. And it can help hone issues for vulnerable communities over time. So that looks like a broad overview of our takeaways. Um, and I want to give folks one more opportunity if they have any last minute thoughts to go ahead and chime in. Yes, hello. Um, Nicole, this is Ivana Bodin. I'm with Absaran Stockton, California. We, Wonderful. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Um, just give me a minute. I, I, I just want to know if there are any work done in the minority community as far as educating them in regard to social justice beforehand, because this is new for us, it's new for me as well from, on this program. So I'm just learning and trying to digest what everybody else is um, sharing information and in, from the commission as well. So I, um, I just want to know if anything has been done or uh, reaching, educating in the Asian community at large or in a, any county or any statewide that you know of? Thank you. Off the top of my head, I can't answer that question. I do know that we definitely have relationships with different um, communities-based organizations, and we do educate them on our plan, our programs, and whatnot. I can't speak to your specific community, but I certainly encourage you, if you would not mind sharing your contact information, and sure. either myself or um, one of our other members can reach out to you and we can definitely provide that. Yes, this, it, yeah, it's our first year, probably just short term grant that we got and just we are trying to implement it in the way that I have not been um, instructed very well. So I'm still learning as I goes and until I know what we are doing in, in order for me to educate the community and hoping of that course. Uh, the grant continues long enough so that we can carry on these missions and to educate this minority group or disadvantaged or underserved community. And I'm hoping that there'll be a long term solutions and long term programs that we can um, at least um, justify the needs and be able to hear the voice and concerns and also to educate and to raise the awareness and also to how do we approach them to collect data from this minority who does not speak the language or the language disparities or the language barrier. And I know that um, uh, the commission is trying to reach out to uh, some organized based organized um, community based organized on stations. However, how, how do we uh, be able to reach out and further um, this this programs or projects or this endeavor to educate um, people about social justice and and environmental safety and things of this nature, which is relatively new for the Asian communities. 
Absolutely. Um, so I'm putting, I put my email, my personal, or not my personal work email at, in the chat. And I'm also putting the email address for the environmental and social justice plan. And we can definitely, if you would like to reach out, we can um, respond directly to your question. Liz, I'm going to note that it's 155. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Hey, Nicole, this is Pilar. Um, I yep. just wanted to, hi, sorry to interrupt. This has been um, a good conversation, but I wanted to reach out to Seng So uh, just to follow up on his comment on sidewalks and streetlights. Your, your local government, Seng, has a Department of Public Works. I'd recommend reaching out to the Department of Public Works at the local level, and they should be able to support you through SB1 funds to, to get sidewalks and streetlights um, accomplished for your community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you. So that's all, if you would like to go ahead and conclude. Okay. Um, so thank you all of you for your time, your listening and your feedback. And uh, we will be considering your comments when we update the ESJ action plan and take some actions. Um, but feel free to submit additional thoughts to ESJ action plan at cpuc.gov. And thank you very much.